Well, I want to say hey to everybody at all of our campuses and all of you joining us online. So glad that you're with us, and uh, we do love you. And, and please know this, we're praying for you. We really are on an ongoing basis, and I personally am praying for you. And I just want you to know, whatever you're facing, God is still bigger. God is still good. He, just keep looking for him because he's with you. So I'm pretty sure that almost all of us have had uh, a story, something Something like this. We talked about this before. We, we started something. It might have been a relationship or a project or a goal or whatever. And there was a clear vision of what you thought it would and could be. And it started in that direction and it was going that way. But then at some point, and we've all experienced this, it kind of took a downward turn and it ended up becoming unhealthy. It's like it, it morphed, like, a, like you had a friendship with somebody at work and you guys teased each other all the time and you liked each other, you, you liked hanging out together, but somewhere somebody got hurt in the teasing and, and then instead of it being enjoyable, it just got meaner and meaner and these days, you don't even talk to each other. What the heck happened? See, it morphed, it moved from what it was and was intended to be to something else. Maybe, maybe you love little, little knickknacks, but we'll call them widgets maybe. And you, you love them so much that you like to collect them. And, and you would go different places in the country and you would find them and collect them and bring them home and put them up on shelves and take people on tours in your house to show them all your widgets. But somewhere, it moved from collecting to an obsession. And now it's affected you financially. You don't even have a place to store all your widgets anymore. And it, it kind of moved from cute to crazy. And that happens. That happens. Honestly, you want to know the truth? That is not what I would describe as abnormal. I would say that that is more normal. All of us have these experiences where, where it starts out and we think it's going to be this, and then it goes in a direction that becomes unhealthy. I'll tell you where you really see this. You see this in religion. I mean, for example, take historical Christianity. It's 2,000 years old. But from the very start, it was happening. Early, early on, for example... In this biblical city of Galatia, the church that first started there, I mean, when they came to Christ, they knew they had no hope, they needed help, and there was God. He moved, worked in their heart. It changed everything in them, and they were so excited. And I don't think it happened quickly, but over a period of time, as so often happens in churches, it moved from being about this deep connection with a living God to kind of a formulaic thing. It was, I mean, it was really kind of about a philosophy of life rather than a connection with God. Actually, there's a portion of Scripture in the New Testament that deals with this very thing. It's in the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Galatians. And I'm going to read a portion of it to you. And this is interesting because actually it's, it, it, it's written very strongly. And I'm going to read it from the message paraphrase. But just, just take a look at this. This is what he says. He says, you crazy Galatians. Somebody put a hex on you? I mean, have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened for it's, it's obvious that you no longer have the crucified Christ in clear focus in your lives. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. So he says, let, let me put this question to you. How did your new life, and he's talking about their Christian life, how did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? And then he says this, he says, are you going to continue this craziness? And I underlined this next one because I wanted to see it. Because he says, only crazy people would think that they could, they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? Now, it's not yet a total loss, he says, but it certainly will be. If you keep this up, I know it's strong words. I mean, he spoke some strong words there. But they're important, see. This is a problem so often we experience in our lives is that we kind of are moving in the wrong direction instead of going in the direction we were started out to, that we want to. I think, actually, if I could kind of condense what he's saying, he's saying, I think you've forgotten who's still God and who still isn't. This is not about you becoming smarter and stronger and better and everything else. This is about your relationship with God. It's about you and God together, not just your hard work. And I want you to hear this because I want, us, I want to finalize this series about higher callings with this understanding. Now look, God built you. He wired you. He gifted you. He did all these amazing things in you 
all that will help you accomplish the higher callings, the destiny that he has for your life. But what you can never forget is that what you needed first and last and everywhere in between is most of all your relationship with God. It is about your connection with God, his spirit working with your spirit. You need his Holy Spirit at work in your life, a deep and abiding relationship with him. That has to be central to everything. If you think it's just about God equipped me and made me so I can be really good at this job and you've forgotten God, you've forgotten what matters. So let's let's just settle this. You were not called and gifted to live out your high callings alone, ever. And I'm not talking that you have to be with people. I'm talking about your connection with God. As followers of Jesus, see, He gives us, for example, let's look at one where he gives us what we call the Great Commission, where he tells us to share this message with the world. But he says it in a very interesting way. Look at this. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, talk about what God's done in your life. Baptize them when they come to Christ in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. There's the mandate. But look at how he ends it. He puts this on. And surely I am what? I am with you always to the very end of the age. Just be clear on this. See, Jesus makes it clear. I'm going to be with you. We will do this together. That's what we'll do. We'll do it together. At another point, he says this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, God's Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, you don't, you're not meant to do this alone. That is not what you're called to. It's so clear. He's saying, I'll be with you, and it will be about you and God working in connection with each other, walking out his destiny, his higher callings for your life. And this is so important because so much of what God calls us to do, I mean, if we're just honest, we're incapable of doing it really well. I mean, we need some, we're just, we're not smart enough or courageous enough or, or skilled enough. We need the power of God's spirit at work in our lives. And as I said, you know, that's how we come to Christ. Just like the Galatian church, we, we come to Christ knowing, I, I cannot do this on my own. I need you, God. And he does this amazing supernatural thing in our lives, something inexplicable, and it's remarkable. It's not just us getting our act together and becoming good people. It's, it's God does something in us. We become part of the family of God. And what God's saying to us is, I'm going to be with you the whole way. And together we will walk out your high calling. You're not meant to do it alone. You're not meant to do your job alone. You're, you're fathering or mothering or you're, 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 whatever it is that you're doing, you're not meant to do that alone. You are meant to do that in connection, in relationship with God. See, here's the deal. I mean, if you're not careful... And let's just be honest about this. If you're not careful, you will move just exactly in the direction that the Galatians did. It's like it starts to become less about your relationship with God and more about just trying to be a good person, trying to, you know, work things out, practicing religion, philosophy of life, all of that. And it's nuts. It's wrong. It's not what we were meant to be. Let me just remind you of the words I underlined that that Paul had written to the Galatians. He said, only crazy people would think that they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. Only crazy people think they're going to finish this thing and make it all perfect. And when it was in fact started by God and needs to be completed by God. But that's what we do. Too often, that's what we do. So let me say it again. We need God's Holy Spirit at work in our lives. We need that. So uh, when I was eight years old, in the church that I was raised in, Howell, Michigan, I became a follower of Jesus. It was a very profound experience for me. I remember it well. I, I, I realized I can never be what I should be, and I don't know what to do about it. And it was like it came to me. You need Christ at work in your life. You need to give your heart to God. And I did that day, and it was profound. But you know how it goes. When you have that encounter with God and then time goes by and that's what happens in the life of a child. You get distracted and and I kind of wandered away from that. But then, then in my early teens, and it was just through a series of interesting circumstances, I began to turn back in the direction of God and I knew I needed him. I needed him at work in my life. And I went after him with a passion. And then I had an experience And this was out in a field in a pasture behind my parents' home where sheep were. I was sitting up 
above a beautiful stream. It was just a perfect day. The sun was shining, and I was just sitting there, and I put my arms out, and I said, God, I want everything you have. I want you to move through me in whatever way you want to. And I will never forget that day because what happened to me, you can call it what you want to, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I don't care what title you give it. But it was so profound in me. And what it, what it did was it was like I felt like I was overflowing with God and I became aware that I should live my life not just trying to be a decent guy, but walking in connection with God listening for his voice, anticipating him to do something. I began to see how important it was that I would expect God to move supernaturally. It has to be more than just my effort. Now, if you were here last week, I I talked about the fact that we all have gifts. And I described, as having read in the uh, chapter 12 of the book of Romans, some of what I would describe as sort of natural gifts. So they might be like serving or giving or teaching or leadership or encouragement or those types of things, things that you have in you that God's kind of done in you and you're just exceptionally great at them. I would call those kind of natural. They're in you and you use them. But as I finish this, I want to talk about a different kind of group of gifts, what I would call spiritual or supernatural gifts where you're looking for God to move not so much in you but through you to to do something powerful and actually supernatural, knowing that he's a God of miracles. We're going to read about this found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and this is what Paul writes. He says there are different kinds of gifts, but it's the same spirit that distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There, There are different kinds of working, but In all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So let's be clear, he says, it's just God. It's God. Now to each one, he says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. Now let me just say parenthetically here, what I'm describing is not that you are an exceptionally wise person. It is a message. You receive supernaturally a piece of wisdom from God to make a difference in the world or in someone's life or in some way. And it's not your wisdom. It is a gift from God. It is a message of wisdom. It's a supernatural thing. And it says, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit, supernatural faith. To another, gifts of healing, supernatural healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. And to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. He says, all these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now to me, and I'm not one to argue these things, and let me be clear on this, but to me what this describes are gifts that are beyond simply our power to fully understand or manipulate. What he's talking about here is the idea of God moving through us in a supernatural way. I know that makes people uncomfortable when you start to talk about it, but but in a supernatural way. And I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to argue this. I'm not going to argue how it happens or, or when it happens or where it should be, all that. People love to argue this stuff, but I will not do that. All I want to say is God is still a supernatural God. Do not miss that point. And I know some of you right now, you're like, oh boy, the old guy's gone crazy, gotten weird in his old age. Okay, number one, yeah, probably I have. I'm not going to deny that. But what I hope all of us can see is that it should never seem strange for us to talk about the supernatural in God in the same breath. If God is not supernatural, what is he? I mean, I mean just fundamentally, if you believe in Jesus, you, you, believe, you believe in something you can't see or touch. You believe that he exists supernaturally. See, Christians, Christians, the historical Christian church faith, the belief of the Christian church, is it that there is a God and he exists supernaturally and that he so loved us in our broken state that he came to us supernaturally as the son of God, Jesus, and then he gave his life up for us and died and then supernaturally rose from the dead and then went into heaven and then supernaturally he gives us his spirit to dwell on the inside of us. I mean, the bottom line is if you believe in Jesus, you believe in the supernatural. Therefore, 
you are a weirdo. All right, let's, just, let's just get it out there. I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that this is a supernatural God we serve and that we are to live in the realm with him. And I get it. You may not be sure where you stand with God, and I understand that. And this is, again, a no-judgment zone. You have to figure that out, and I pray that you do. But for those of us who have encountered him, see, what, what we want, and when we come to our senses, because sometimes we wander away from it, but when we do what we want is not a philosophy of life. You can get that anywhere. We want a connection with a God who exists and loves us, and he is supernatural. Now, having said all that, I want to tell you about my own personal journey when it comes to this area, because I have quite a bit of background in this, and the truth is, is that I've seen so much weirdness in some kinds in different churches, and so much what I would describe as wacky stuff, and maybe, I can't really, it's not my place to judge, but maybe even dishonest, like people giving credit to God for things that really it wasn't God, and just all that stuff. I've seen enough of that stuff that, that I kind of went like, like if you have a road and this ditch is like you're over the top crazy into the, what you would just, everything is supernatural and nothing is natural, and then you go over here and it's like, yes, I'm a believer in Jesus, but I'm not looking for the supernatural. I, I moved from this ditch and I, I wanted to just get up on top of the road and be there kind of say, okay, I believe in it, but I'm just, but I found myself often sliding off in the ditch where I, it was like I wasn't even anticipating the supernatural. I wasn't even looking for God to move. And yet I can't read the Bible I can't really engage in Christianity and not see that he is a supernatural God. I cannot read the Bible and not be aware of how he wants to work in our lives in ways we simply are unable to accomplish in our own. And what I know is that we are called by Jesus to live lives that that don't just say, yeah, I believe in God, but, but we live with an anticipation. God will move. God will work. God will, I brought this to God, and I don't know how he's going to do it, but God God will work on our behalf. We anticipate that. I think we should be looking for God to move, and I struggle with this. We should be open to miracles, because without them, I mean, how are we going to live out our higher callings, really? We need his spirit at work in our lives. And I don't, look, I don't claim to understand all this. I absolutely don't. I've had times where I've prayed for something fervently and it did not happen. I prayed for someone to live who was sick and they die. I prayed for something to to come to pass and it did not ever. The opposite happened, all kinds of things like that. And then I've had times where I've prayed for people to live and they did live with a death sentence. I've seen God do many miraculous things. We prayed and and God moved. I, I can't answer all the questions. And there have been plenty of times where I've just seen God do miraculous stuff and I wasn't even... (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me, I, <coughs> I wasn't even asking him for it. He just, he moved. I, I was talking about this with someone recently, and I was remembering a time, this, uh, this was a long time ago. This was like when our, we had, maybe had one baby or two babies. I can't even remember exactly the timing, but, you know, in the early days of this church, Ann and I, we would have considered ourselves, at least I saw it that way, kind of, we were on the edge of poverty. I understand in relationship to the rest of the world, we were, we were fine, we were well off, but we weren't really able to pay all our bills. I'm working full-time, and then I'm working as a pastor, and then I'm working part-time job, two days a week, trying to make enough to pay our bills, and things were just hard. And we, we were at a point where we were tired and felt exhausted, and there was a conference, and we so wanted to go to this. It was out of state, and, and we just desperately wanted to go. But I said, Anna, I said, there's just no way. We can't even pay our bills. She said, well, how much would it cost to go? And I just kind of did a quick calculation. I said, we'd have to have $300. She said, okay. And I said, but it would be a miracle. Man of faith that I was, I was like, it would be a miracle. Like, that'll never happen. A few days later, a guy calls me. He says, hey, Jeff, can I meet you for breakfast? And I thought he maybe wanted counseling or talk about spiritual things. So I said, sure, we met for breakfast. And as we're talking, he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I was in the bathtub. And that's where I started to get uncomfortable, okay? I didn't want to hear about that. He said, I was in the bathtub. And I said, oh, I, you know, I really, no. He said, no, no, just listen. He said, I was in the bathtub and God started speaking to me about you. And I said, now I really don't want to hear what you have to say. He said, stop it. Just listen to me. I was in the bathtub. And God started speaking to me about you. And he told me to give you this. And then he reached down and he pulled out an envelope. Clearly it had money in it. And when it came across that breakfast table, I was like, look, dude, no, no. Because that's always been hard for me. And I was like, I'm not, 
you know, he didn't know where we were at. He knew nothing about our circumstances. And he just said, look, he spoke to me when I was in. The, I said, all right, if you'll stop talking about being in the bathtub, I'll take the envelope, all right? And so I took it. We finished our breakfast. He went his way. I went my way. And when I cracked that envelope open and looked in it, there was to the penny $300. And we have seen God do that time and time again. He is still a God of the supernatural. And I'm not trying to get weird here, and I'm not going to argue this stuff. People get all worked up about this. I just think if you believe in Jesus, you already believe in the supernatural. And if you want to live out his higher calling in your life, you got to be looking for it. you got to be anticipating God's Spirit moving. And I'm just challenging you, and I'm challenging me. This is what I think. I think we should be looking for miracles. I think we should be anticipating a move of God in our lives. I don't think we should just go through the motions. We should be looking for it. So, so let me just give you a couple thoughts, and then I'm going to finish this, and we'll be done. If you want to live out your higher callings from God, and I purposefully ended this here, it has to be with God. And so my first challenge is just to look for the Holy Spirit at work. Look for God working. This is my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong on this, but many of us call ourselves believers, but I think we live more like functional atheists. We don't expect God to move. We don't anticipate that he's going to move. We say we believe he's there, but we believe that he's so distant. It's like, I got this problem. I'm going to have to figure this out. I got to handle it myself. Nobody else is going to take care of it for me. And so we don't, we, it's like we have no anticipation that God will even move. And I just, I just think we're probably wrong in that. And I struggle with this too. Get be clear on this. This is a, a recovering person in this area. But I think we should be looking for the Holy Spirit. We should be anticipating that it'll move. You know, actually, don't you, that that is faith? That's faith, and that's what God wants from us. Actually, the Bible says that's what it takes to please God. Look at this scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, without faith, it is what? It is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to miss him must believe that he exists. He's supernatural. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That he moves supernaturally in their lives. Number one, I challenge you, look for the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And then number two, I would challenge you as well, and I'm challenging me on this, to listen for and respond to those inner promptings. Like when you hear God speak something, and maybe you're not even sure it's God all the time, but you just have the sense, I think I need to talk to this person. I think I, think I need to send them an email. I cannot tell you how many times I've been praying, and I have this thought, send someone a text or an email, and I do it, and they respond by saying, you have no idea on the timing. Just, just be looking for the Holy Spirit, and then when you feel those promptings, just, just respond to them. And I know some of you may be saying, well, what if I, I don't want to get weird. What if I, I, I would just say, don't worry about it, really. Unless it's unbiblical, just roll with it. When you feel God speaking to you, look for it. Because people who are looking for God, they see him moving. Last week, I said that sometimes, I believe we Christians don't think big enough. We get into circumstances where we're like, ah, oh, it's the end of the world. We don't go, what are you up to, God? Where are you at work? And what would you have me do? And I want to challenge you on that. And I just want to remind you that as you go through, whatever you're experiencing, whatever's happening in your life, you are not alone. And he who is with you is a God of the supernatural. And I think we should open our hearts and say, God, come and move. Okay, so I'm done. And now at all our campuses, we're going to spend some time in worship together. And you know, this is a great time to just open up your heart and say, God, I want, to, I want to come back. I want all you have. Maybe you want to be like I was all those years ago in that pasture above the stream where I just said, come God, fill me with all you have. Maybe you want to do that. Maybe you want to just stand before him and say, help me to keep an open heart to you, whatever it is, now in this time. Let's open our hearts to God. So would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we now invite you to come and work in our midst. Move, help us to be open to living out your higher calling by looking for you, by anticipating that you'll move. 
And we trust you will. In Jesus' name, amen.